Juan Gris' achievements and contributions to the advancement of modern art were extraordinary. Over the course of a short career in France spanning about 17 years, he went from being an ardent admirer of Paul Cezanne's work to becoming a Cubist innovator, with significant changes to his style every year or two. Unlike his contemporaries, Pablo Picasso, Georges Braque, and Fernand Leger, Gris is not well known in the United States today, despite his many accomplishments. His works are well represented in American museums, uh, but monographic exhibitions of his paintings and collages are few and far between. Why are some artists considered essential to tell the story of art in the early 20th century and others less so? As with many other European modernists, Gris' work was embraced early on by a small but, but dedicated group of individuals. His early reception in America is the story of supported, supportive galleries and dedicated collectors. When surveying the list of Gris paintings that are owned by museum, American museums today, the majority were donated by private collectors, uh, with institutions making purchases on very rare occasions. This unusual fact uh, prompts the following inquiry into Gris' early reception in America in order to learn more about how the arts community would have first discovered him, how they would have known about him at all, um, and, and, and start to appreciate his many contributions to art making in the first half of the 20th century. My talk today will focus on early gallery and museum exhibitions, important art dealers, and key American collectors of Gris' work, who generously shared their collections with the wider public during this early period. The writer and collector Gertrude Stein was one of Gris' first American patrons, although she lived most of her adult life in Paris. They first met in 1910, and four years later, she began to buy examples of his work from the dealer Daniel Henry Conviler, with whom she shared an affinity for the Spanish artists. Her Gris holdings would have been on view in her Paris apartment, where she hosted frequent gatherings for writers, artists, and other culturally interested guests. So they would have been seen by many Americans and Europeans. Uh, for example, the beautiful uh, collage that we see there on the right flowers of 1914. Uh, the friendship between Stein and Gris, and Gris grew closer in the 1920s. She wrote a word poem about him in 1924 in which she described him as a perfect painter, and she was devastated by his death. Uh, Gris' first monographic exhibition was held in Paris in 1919. It was the first of several one-person gallery shows of his work held in the French capital during those early years. His work began to appear in galleries in New York in the teens as well, with early mentions of his inclusion at the Modern Gallery in 1916 and 1918, and in the first annual exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists in New York in 1917. Despite the fact that Gris was first on Picasso's list of suggested European artists, to be included in the famous Armory Show of 1913, the exhibition which introduced audiences in New York, Boston, and Chicago to contemporary art, uh, the organizers did not choose him, and he did not show his work in New York until later in the decade. Uh, this may not have been a terrible thing, uh, because he was therefore not a victim of the overwhelmingly negative response to Cubism in that show um, from the critics and the general public um, after the show and its, its immediate aftermath. Gris began to receive mentions in American art magazines in the late teens, um, magazines we may not have not heard of today, such as Arts and Decoration and The Soil. Um, in 1921, he was included in a group show of living artists at, in New York at Wana, Wanamaker's department store, along with other post-impressionist cubist and futurist artists. Uh, Gris' first American solo gallery exhibition was held in New York in November of 1930. Uh, two years later, the Marie Harriman Gallery in New York hosted a one-man show, and we have the brochure for it on the left of the screen, uh, which featured uh, over 20 oil paintings and 11 watercolors and drawings, all from American collectors. Um, only one work at that point was in uh, the Columbus Gallery of Fine Arts, uh, and we see a, a beautiful work from their collection uh, there on the right from 1913. Um, that was the only, only museum work in the show. Um, in his review for the New York Times, Edward Allen Jewell was mainly positive about Gris, um, although he spent a long, a major part of his review trying to, to decipher how to define his artistic output. As time passed after Gris' death in 1927, his importance as a pioneering modernist was seen in museums throughout the United States. In the 1930s, his work was included in group exhibitions in both large city institutions and college galleries 
in Chicago, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Hartford, Cambridge, Bennington, Vermont, Toledo, and Poughkeepsie, among others. Gris' debut at the Museum of Modern Art uh, took place in 1933 in, in what was known as the Summer Show, which I think was often when private collectors went out of town, they would lend things to the museum uh, to have things for people to see while they were in the city. Uh, and it was made up mostly of, of, that exhibition was made up mostly of works from those kinds of private collections. Uh, in 1936, the Museum of Modern Art organized Cubism and Abstract Art, the first major museum exhibition in the United States that included GRI. It was a massive show, which was comprised of about 386 works and included examples of many schools of contemporary art all at one time. Uh, it presented four paintings, one collage and one sculpture by GRI. Uh, by comparison, there were 29 works by Picasso, but only nine by Braque and five by Leger. And on the right, we have the wonderful painting currently in the Dallas Museum of Arts collection, Guitar and Pipe of 1913, uh, one of the seminal works to really uh, inspire this exhibition. Uh, the extensive catalog for the Museum of Modern Arts show um, uh, included a very positive description of Gris collages and canvases. Um, and for example, they said the catalog wrote, during the early years of synthetic cubism, Gris held his own even against Picasso and Brock achieving a, a series of collages and painted compositions unsurpassed in precision and refinement. Although the more conservative art critics did not widely, wildly praise the show, it did make a major statement about the future of European modernism in the United States. Two more monographic exhibitions in galleries were held in the 40s in New York, including um, two important ones at the Buchholz Gallery, uh, which uh, was headed by Kurt Valentin. One of Gris' great admirers and, promor and promoters, Valentin played a major role in placing works by the Spanish Cubist artists in private collections throughout the United States in the 1940s and early 50s. Valentin first showed his work in a group show in 1940, um, but the first monographic show was in 44, where he borrowed works from private collectors and art dealers. Um, and a couple of things from museums, the Albright Art, uh, the Albright art Gallery, now known as the Albright Knox Art Gallery, Lent. Um, as did MoMA and the Smith College Museum of Art in Northampton, Massachusetts. And we see the brochure for the catalog on the left um, from 1944, as well as one of the works from the Smith College collection. The Book Colts Gallery organized two more Gris exhibitions, one in 1947, the next in 1950. In the catalog for the 1947 show, Valentine stated that, that most of the paintings in the show had not been seen in the United States before and that MoMA and the Smith College Museum were the only museum lenders. Thanks to Valentin's determination and support, the Buchholz Gallery played a prominent part in furthering Gris' reputation, both the United States and America. Now back to Smith, um, it's a very interesting thing. The first works by Gris to enter a museum collection uh, were five early still lives donated to the Smith College Museum of Art in 1921 and 1923 by the art dealer Joseph Brummer. We don't know why he chose Smith, uh, we have looked into it, and there was no relationship between Brummer and the college that we're aware of. Um, but it was would have been considered a very unusual gift to a college museum at a time when modern art was not widely appreciated or understood. These works ended up being important for shows for decades. Uh, people always would go to them to borrow them, which uh, is was wonderful. Uh, for example, museum borrowed them in the 30s. Um, the Buchholz Gallery borrowed them over the time, uh, as we discussed earlier, and it, it was really um, so rare and, and they were so accessible that it really allowed a lot of people to be introduced to his work in this unusual way. Um, the many private collectors that were buying works at his time, many of them were buying them in Paris uh, when they would go for their jaunts over there, they would be introduced to them. Um, although once uh, World War II, uh, people stopped traveling so much and so New York galleries started to show and have his works for sale as well. Although he chose not to donate many of his more than uh, 25,000 works of art to a museum, uh, the American collector John Quinn purchased at least six works by Gris of the highest quality during these early years, um, including the one that we see on the left, Ace of Clubs and Four Diamonds, now uh, owned by uh, the National Gallery of Art. Um, and the same way, uh, the Pittsburgh collector G. David Thompson also had a remarkable modern art collection, including 12 works by Gris, he, Thompson had very much wanted to create a museum 
in his hometown of Pittsburgh dedicated to his collection. Uh, but it was clear that uh, people in town were not interested in supporting modern art at that time, so he ended up selling most of his collection. Uh, but mandolin and fruit dish that we see here on the right, uh, now in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, had once been owned by him. Another important person was Albert Eugene Gallatin. He played an essential role in furthering Grease's reputation in the United States as both a major collector and the director of the first public institution of modern art in New York, uh, which opened in 1927. He was in a unique position to promote and provide access to artists that weren't available anywhere else, um, and provided also an opportunity for local artists to see works by Cubist and other modern painters um, close to home, and he even offered classes. Um, this desire to educate the public uh, prompted the, the uh, gallery to open, which was originally known as the Gallery of Living Art, opened in 1927 um, at, the, at New York University where Gallatin was a trustee, and he took over some extra space um, and started to install his own collection, and it, it ended up becoming a very uh, a, you know, major place to see things. He published a lot, published a lot of catalogs, and wrote a lot about the artists that he liked so much. In 1936, uh, after having lots of positive response, he changed the name of the institution from the Gallery of Living Art to the Museum of Living Art. Um, and pointed out how Gris in particular and Spanish artists um, more broadly uh, were men of burning genius that really needed to be appreciated. And here we see a beautiful collage from the Gallatin collection on the left, as well as, as its installation in one of the Gallery of Living Art um, uh, exhibitions in, at NYU back in, in the 30s. Um, it, uh, he continued to, to support Cubism uh, even up until the 40s and was really very interested in showing their work and introducing them to a larger public as pe more and more people came to his gallery. However, in 1942, the university informed Gallatin that they needed the space where the museum was held for, where the museum was housed for their library, and he was forced to leave and close the museum. Uh, after much consideration, Gallatin decided to loan his collection of about 170 works to the Philadelphia Museum of Art just down south, um, with the understanding that if the holdings were still on loan upon his death, they would be acquired by the PMA, where uh, they are today. Uh, Gallatin also played a major role in suggesting that wonderful works by Gris and others owned um, uh, by Walter and Louise Ahrensberg also come to the PMA, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where the two collections uh, could, could come together to create an unrivaled view of modern art the Ahrensbergs had uh, begun collecting modern art after seeing the Armory Show in 1913, um, became friends and patrons uh, with some of the most important artists of the day. And um, in 1938, they bought five wonderful works by Gris, and, and three of them are in the exhibition um, on Gris that, that we are celebrating today. In the 40s, uh, the Ahrensbergs started to look for a museum that would take their work. Um, and after seeing uh, the reception to the Gallatin collection with his suggestion, uh, they decided to give their collection to the PMA in Philadelphia in 1950. Um, and in 1954, a suite of galleries dedicated to Gallatin's collection opened, followed by another suite of galleries to the Ahrensburg collection uh, later that year in October. And within those two collections combined, the PMA has become a center for, for modern art with one of the strongest and largest, most comprehensive uh, collections of Grease work in the United States. Uh, Duncan Phillips. Uh, who, had found in the Phil who had founded the Phillips Memorial Art Gallery, today known as the Phillips Collection, in 1921 in Washington, D.C., um, which was, a was the first Museum of Modern Art, uh, bought his first work by Gris that we see here on the left, Abstraction, from 1915 in 1930, uh, which was a very small but colorful and beautiful work um, that really shows his interest in abstraction and, and, and synthesis. Uh, about 20 years later, he bought Still Life with the Newspaper, that we see here on the right uh, from a very different period of his career when he was um, looking back to old master paintings and artists that he knew from his time in Madrid. Um, uh, that painting on the right had been seen early on in the 1930s in a big exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. So it was wonder it's a wonderful, uh, it really does a great job in showing his career with these two works. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art began acquiring works by Gris in the 30s and 40s. Uh, the work here on the right is a uh, guitar and pipe that I mentioned before from the Dallas Museum of Art. It had originally been owned by the Museum of Modern Art um, and had uh, 
been sold in the 60s. Um, luckily for all of us, it was soon acquired by Eugene and Margaret McDermott, wonderful collectors of Impressionist and Modern Art who donated it to the uh, DMA in 1998. Um, uh, the, the Guggenheim also in the, in the 40s started to collect works by Gris. So in the 40s, things really started to pick up with museum collections as well as uh, the National Gallery of Art opened in 1941 and a major gift of modernism, including Gris' work, was given to Yale University also that same year. So into the 40s, Gris' reputation really started to grow in the United States, at least in museum collections. Um, both the City Art Museum of St. Louis, uh, today known as the St. Louis Art Museum, um, and the Washington University Museum in St. Louis, now known as the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, uh, both purchased works by Gris in the 40s, um, which was very unusual. At that time, most museums were only acquiring works by him as gifts. Um, and these two purchases made some important statements about the institution's need, interest in modern art and our wonderful uh, works by him and wonderful additions to um, the show. Uh, Sadie Adler May, a collector born in Baltimore, uh, purchased two important works by Gris, uh, one in 1938 and one in 1940. Unlike uh, the better known Baltimore collectors and sisters, Clara Bell and Etta Cohn, who favored works by Ari Matisse and Pablo Picasso and displayed their holdings in their Baltimore apartments, um, Sadie May uh, saw her, her role as one as an advocate for the Baltimore Museum of Art, often sending her acquisitions directly to the museum um, after purchase directly from the galleries. Uh, May, uh, really wanted to make sure the, the BMA's collection wasn't so heavily focused on Matisse and Picasso. So she started to look for artists like Gris, um, like Mondrian, artists that you know were more interested interested in abstraction um, to really round out the collection of the of the BMA. And uh, as well as being really interested in surrealism. And in these two works on the left, Bottle and Glass from 1918 is a sort of prime example of Gris and his mid-career um, just as his interest in, in little dots of paint and pointillism had started to fade and he started to become fascinated with interlocking planes and a more muted palette. Um, to, she purchased that in 1938, 1940. She bought The Painter's Window, uh, one of Gris' last works, um, a really wonderful work that um, shows all of the still life motifs that he had used up to that point um, in his career. The, the musical instruments, the cards, the fruit set before a window, but one of the few to include the artist's palette to show his tools and somehow seems to be a reflection of his own um, biography and the way he's added it to, uh, to this particular painting. Uh, the Cincinnati Art Museum hosted Gris' first monographic show in 1948, uh, more than 20 years after his death. And here we see the brochure and a couple of fabulous paintings um, that uh, were in the exhibition. Um, it featured 64 works, um, and about a third of them were already owned by museums, and two thirds were owned by private collectors. In the introduc introduction to the catalog, um, uh, even back then, uh, there was conversation about why Gris wasn't better known, and the author talked about you know, perhaps it was because Gris was always used in books to talk about the tenets of Cubism, and nobody really looked to see that the wonderful things he was making. Um, also, he had such a short career that perhaps uh, you know, his other his his colleagues Picasso and Brock had gone on to other styles, and it was you know Gris who stuck with Cubism for a long time, and perhaps um, the short career and and the 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 commitment to Cubism may have made him some for some reason less appealing, but he certainly didn't uh, agree. Uh, Ten years later, in 1958, the Museum of Modern the Museum of Modern Art organized a major Juan Gris retrospective, which traveled to the Minneapolis Muse Institute of Arts, the San Francisco Museum of Art, and the Los Angeles County Museum. Um, it fe featured 63 paintings and 27 gouaches, drawings, and prints from his short career. Again, many more works in the exhibition were owned by private collectors than by museums. Um, and doing research, um, I found there was a list preparing for the show of 42 collectors in the United States that owned a Gris work. Um, only 13 were museums uh, for the preparations for this show. So that gives you a sense of how it took a long time for museums to kind of catch up and understand his brilliance. In the catalog, 
Um, the curator discussed the originality of Gris' color, um, which of course is what he's so well known for, and wondered if maybe some of his lack of, of familiarity with the general public had to do with his reproductions were often in black and white, and um, you know, which is something that today is so funny to think about, how we're so used to seeing images in color and quickly and on our devices. Um, back in those days, you were really reliant on black and white imagery to, to learn about uh, new artists. Um, uh, the exhibition were very well received, uh, was, was very well received, um, and the New York Times art critic wrote something that, uh, quote, that Gris' work warrants his inclusion in the first rank of Cubist artists. Despite this great interest in Gris um, during the run of the MoMA show um, and the broad recognition of his importance visible in museum exhibitions and collections around the country, it took 25 years for the next major monographic museum show to be mounted in the United States. In 1983, the University of California Art Museum at Berkeley organized a major retrospective, which also traveled to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and to the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York. It featured more than 90 works and provided a fresh view of grief you know, as one of the most essential members of the Cubist circle. Uh, John Russell uh, wrote in a review, quote, uh, in the New York Times, quote, a great grief stays with us forever. It stands for an imaginative energy, a multiplicity of lucid statement, and an, and an apparently limitless invention. It also stands for a depth and strength of color that are on the whole were excluded from cubism. Where Picasso and Brock and the, Brock and the heroic years worked by taking color out, Gris worked by putting it in." Unquote. Um, unlike his colleagues Picasso, Brock, and Leger, Gris's work has not been explored by theme or examined in slices or chapters of his output until now. Um, and more recent years, his work has been uh, enthusiastically collected by the, the New York businessman and philanthropist Leonard Lauder, uh, who has given either his promise gifts or finished gifts um, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and has created the Leonard Lauder Research Center for Modern Art, where uh, scholars and curators look at uh, Gris and his circle um, for exhibitions and papers. Um, his extraordinary contribution uh, to the recognition and understanding of Gris' achievements will continue for generations to come. Um, as Daniel Henry Kahnweiler wrote about his friend Juan Gris in 1948, more than 20 years after his death, quote, time will, I am sure, increase more and more the reputation of this modest genius who received so little encouragement during his all but too short life, but who never despaired, unquote. And thank you very much.